Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives, episode 75. Like what, what, and a lot of breaking news in between. Uh, well done, we survived. <laughs> wow, uh, I'm Heidi Kuda. I'm with High Fidelity Jim Stewartson. We are an investigative show about disinformation and uh, mainstream media is starting to catch up. Uh, there was just a MSNBC report all about radicalization and they even used the word radicalized in the headline. So super glad to hear that, you know, there are some, uh, you know, some some signs of a pulse with our corporate media, um, truly. Uh, so we have an incredibly brilliant, insightful interview with the Ukrainian soldier and filmmaker Volodymyr Demchenko. You guys have met him on the show before. We are so grateful that he um, returned to join us on a two day leave from Kyiv before actually getting sent back, uh, you know, be, being de redeployed. Um, so I don't want to waste too much time. I want to just jump right into front loaded if you guys are cool with that. Front loaded. So there's a lot of money and effort um, being put behind Marjorie Taylor Greene to glamorize her, whitewash her background, uh, make her hair blonder, her face tanner. There she is everywhere. New book uh, to kind of give her that sort of presidential, vice presidential veneer. All of it, of course, is nonsense. She is very dangerous, um, obviously a traitor. She tried to help overthrow our country even asked for a preemptive pardon. But I am really shocked and horrified that too many people have not seen the video of her as she stalked a Parkland survivor. Here is my friend Fred Gutenberg pointing out that Marjorie Taylor Greene harassed him just weeks after the Parkland shooting where his daughter was killed. I want to remind people she called him a coward and let's see that video. Yeah. David, why are you supporting the red flag laws? If there had been, if Scott Peterson, the resource officer at Parkland had done his job, then Nicholas Cruz wouldn't have killed anybody in your high school or at least protected them. Why are you supporting red flag gun laws that attack our second amendment rights? And why are you using kids to get to, as a barrier? Do you not know how to defend your stance? Look, I'm an American citizen. I'm a gun owner. I have a concealed carry permit. I carry a gun with, for, for protection for myself. And you are using your lobby and the money behind it and the kids to try to take away my Second Amendment rights. You don't have anything to say for yourself? You can't defend your stance? How did you get over 30 appointments with senators? How'd you do that? How did you get major press coverage on this issue? And how did you get kids? Why do you use kids? Why kids? You know, if school, if school zones were protected by with security guards with guns, there would be no mass shootings at schools. Do you know that? The best way to stop a bad guy with a gun is with a good guy with a gun. The reason it's important to start there is because I see these fires burning, these these very dangerous people, people like Robert Kennedy Jr., Marjorie Taylor Greene, Mike Johnson. These are very dangerous people. They're trying to remake Marjorie Taylor Greene in some sort of a, you know, uh, they're going to they're going to repaint her as some sort of champion, obviously, of Christian nationalism. I want to start, though, with her origins as a QAnon troll stalking, uh, you know, survivors of mass shootings. There's plenty of video out there showing her in her QAnon heyday. I would very much like people to be aware of that because every single week she appears more tan, more blonde to try to deliver us to soft fascism. And as Ruth ben Giat said, it's not just the strong men, it's the strong women. And Maloney in Italy is an example of soft fascism. Gentlemen, uh, help me out here. Well, I just need to point out that like Marjorie Taylor Greene's history goes farther back than harassing David Hogg. 
if you've ever seen this article about uh, Kevin Van Ostel, who was her initial opponent in a political race, um, she used Gamergate tactics against him. Or as if you watched our last episode, uh, our interview with Alex Alvarova, Zersetsum. Uh, she destroyed this man's life. She destroyed his marriage. She had people stalking him, harassing him. She is an agent. Her history proves that. Why are we letting anyone whitewash what she is and what connection she has to the attempted coup to overthrow the American government? They've been doing this a long time, putting their operators in place. It's freaking obvious. I don't know why people don't see the connections. Thank you. Go ahead, Jim. She, uh, Margie was uh, a QAnon person super early, like within a couple of weeks uh, of it starting, she was already spreading QAnon stuff. Um, she is absolutely just a programmed um, android who says all the quiet parts and and the you know the idea that they're going to whitewash her into some kind of normalized candidate is you know i mean it's just a sign of the times i mean we've got uh seven mountains dominionist two heartbeats from the presidency so you know nothing should be shocking anymore no, it shouldn't. And as our audience grows, and we've always boxed above our weights, we've always had a bigger influence than our numbers because of our media outreach and the spotlight on us. I just want to make sure people are acutely aware of what's going on and give them the ammunition they need to uh, fight back. And um, in the report I did recently on Alex Jones, which showed him radicalizing people to target Parkland um, sh uh, shooting victims' parents. I do want Marjorie Taylor Greene to know that there is a man right now in federal prison for stalking Fred Gutenberg. So uh, we're not going to take our eye off facts and reality. And people like her who torment others uh, is not somebody to, uh, you know, be whitewashed in any way, shape, or form. Who is a clear and present danger to our country. I would just like to point out that Marjorie Taylor Greene asked for a pardon. All right. That's not an accident. You only ask for forgiveness if you know you've done something wrong. Yeah. So clearly she must know exactly what she is, which is a dangerous operative against democracy. Uh, so next item, gentlemen, thank you for that. I want to turn to our brilliant friend, Sean Norris's latest report in her Substack. You can find her at Sean Uska, Sean Nuska writes, S-I-A-N-U-S-H-K-A. I don't, I'm not pronouncing it right. Um, she picked up on something that Julia Davis reporting, who of course is the expert in analyzing Russian disinformation. Uh, she tweeted out a, a uh, billboard showing the link between Putin's current and potential wars looming restrictions on abortion from Russia. And we're going to be talking more about this with Volodymyr Demchenko, because what Russia is doing is just trying to put out, as Sean wrote, cannon fodder for the state and deprive people of their humanity, deprive people of their rights. And Sean does an absolute, she, she's the author of a book, Bodies Under, Under Siege, which shows how misogyny and taking away women's rights and women's health care rights is, uh, you know, one of the uh, fascist playbook, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the things that first happens when there is an authoritarian uh, creep occurring. Her book, Bodies Under Siege, goes into more details on this, but she talks about the three uh, key pillars of fascist ideology, the natural order, the mythic past, and number three, the constant state of war. Russia is aggressively pursuing all three. You guys probably know what the natural order is. I can report from Sean, or you guys jump in now. Um, it, misogyny is is uh, the easiest way to, di to divide a population because there's always a 50-50-ish split and if and they the you know the men they they just uh, men suck 
I'm sorry, but, <laughs> you know. Not it, according to the natural order. <laughs> well, exactly. But the, but the natural order is, is bullshit. Um, right. And, uh, it, you know, it's just, these are all just leftovers from fucking caveman days. And, right. um, you know, these guys just weaponize um, these differences and divisions uh, to do exactly what they're doing now, which is to traumatize the population uh, and basically just make everyone give up. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And just a few more details on what, what the natural order is in context of the fascist creep. It's the thought architecture where men are supposedly uh, superior, women inferior, white people superior, yada, 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 all total bullshit, but it's used to have women be subordinate to the quote unquote patriarchal authority. And it's very important um, that Sean actually explains how this works. And of course, we've talked much about the mythic past here. And uh, it's just that. But it, again, this report is brilliant. I highlight it because I'd like everybody to read it so we can see uh, what we are fighting. And then when we talk to Vlad in this interview that's coming up, uh, he gives us a very clear cut path on how to defeat Russia. And it's basically by defeating the empire state of Russia entirely and dismantling it. So that is that is that is what our options are and we're going to keep on um putting that information and that messaging out there anything else before we jump on to number three my happy hour on tuesday at betty dangerous we had a surprise visit from david pepper and he talked specifically he gave us a pep rally on what we need to do in defense of democracy and there are some very practical things i want to bring up a there's a timetable he said that one of the worst things that we did was allow 60% of uh, the Oklahoma congressional candidates to run unopposed. Uh, we allowed 50% in, um, I think it was Kentucky. So what he said is that while Ed is not really paying attention, there are deadlines coming up to put candidates out there. So we run everywhere. He said that there's no reason why we cannot take back the House. He also pointed out, and I believe this is true, that what really has mobilized people finally at the ballot box is the overturning of Roe and how that woke people up and that we continue to have big wins that then get papered over by all of the uh, junk and garbage coming out of the insurrection uh, caucus. And um, he said that right now, Ohio just had a big win in support of women's rights and women's health care rights. And immediately the Ohio GOP started making noise that they were going to defy this. And they started doubling and tripling down on their lawlessness. And he said, if the Ohio GOP does what they say they're going to do, he's going to need a million people at the state house in Ohio. So he's going to send us the bat signal because he's going to need our help, just like he needed our various communities help in exposing what was happening in Ohio. He's going to need our help to show up at the Ohio Capitol. So that's just a few things I wanted to point out. And of course, David Pepper, our viewers know, is the author of Laboratories of Autocracy. All the things that have been tested and weakened at the federal level start in state houses when no one's looking. And I'm very grateful to him. But that's uh, that's front loaded, guys. So I'm just going to call it right here, right now. Uh, David Pepper needs to be the next governor of Ohio. Just period. It has to happen. Uh, I, I, the corruption in this state. Uh, you know, issue one passed, which was instituting uh, women's reproductive rights in the Ohio Constitution. The Republican Party in Ohio is now attempting to fight implementing the will of the voters. Uh, issue two passed, the legalization of recreational marijuana in Ohio. Uh, the Republican uh, government in Ohio has said that, well, we're going to change some things about it before we institute it. Um, again, denying the will of the people. Uh, it's, it's, Ohio truly is the heart of it all when it comes to corruption. 
and states need to clean up their own. And uh, I think David Pepper is the guy to do it. I think Ohio needs a little pepper. Uh, he, what's great is every time Hi-Fi says you're going to be the next governor, David never denies it. He's like, well, I'm going to be running for something again soon. So wouldn't that be wonderful? We, we'd all be uh, playing a role in doing something really, really good for this country. All right. So Hi-Fi, why does it matter? Why high fidelity? First story this week, a message to you, Rudy. And that has to do with Ukrainian lawmaker Dubinsky has been detained on suspicion of treason. Uh, Specifically, he is accused of working with GRU operatives. That's right, Russian intelligence operatives. And why does that matter? And why is this a message to Rudy? Because America's mayor and defendant in a number of legal cases, uh, he was getting information from Dubinsky. So just to lay this out in simple as possible terms, Trump's lawyer, Rudy Giuliani, was getting information to run operations against the Bidens from Russian intelligence through Dubinsky. Okay, that's not that's not an arguable fact. It's just a fact. So that's why it matters. Well, Jim, would you like to go next? Because I would like to say something in response to that. Go ahead. Go ahead. Ah, well, uh, that's not the only Trump associate who has been charged and in one case convicted of treason because Trump's campaign manager worked with Uh, The former president of Ukraine, who was a Russian proxy and puppet, who had to flee during a revolution, and he has been convicted of treason from uh, Ukraine. And Paul Manafort, Trump's former campaign manager, then took on Trump as a client pro bono to get right with the Russian oligarchs that he was in debt to. Uh, So it's not surprising that Trump's personal lawyer would be closely aligned with somebody else who's been charged with treason because there is a network involved in this, as Hi-Fi might say, and a lot of blinking lights. The fucking Russians. I mean, what? (laughs) We got to just stop pussyfooting around here. The fucking lawyer of Trump was talking to GRU. Period. We're done. We like why are we fucking pretending anymore about any of this? It's the goddamn Russians who are infiltrating our country, t- compromising our politicians, turning people into, you know, fascist androids. And I'm fucking tired of it. Like we need to d- defeat this this enemy force which is, you know, Uh, attacking our allies in our own country. Absolutely. And we know that it's being exposed more and more every day because Trump's up there doing the Russia, Russia, Russia propaganda again. It's like that, 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 that's all he's, that's all he's got. It's like, yeah, you're right. You're a traitor. You're just like the former president of Ukraine who now lives in exile in Russia after Mm -hmm. he, you know, uh, completely pilfered as many billions from the country as he possibly could. So we at RadPod are on to the con right here. Yes, high five. I would argue that Trump cannot be allowed to simply go into exile because the networked insurgency, the cult that is built around Donald Trump, uh, would simply turn to violence if he fled the country and lived somewhere else. Uh, no, Trump must be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. He must pay his price. Uh, he must not be allowed to regain power. And the man needs accountability for his treason. Of course. But the reason I started this episode with Marjorie fucking Taylor Greene and referencing Robert fucking Kennedy Jr. is because they will find a new avatar and they're already testing them out. So, yes, Trump needs accountability, but all of these uh, traitors in America need accountability, in my opinion. All right. 
Next item this week, let the PSYOPs begin. What am I talking about with that? Well, I think everyone's paid attention to the fact that, uh, you know, the theocratic radical over here, Mike Johnson, uh, has released 44,000 hours of sensitive January 6th footage. Uh, he didn't actually release for all 44,000 hours. Uh, there was a uh, preliminary release that has already been being used by PSYOPs uh, across social media in which peaceful protesters are seen walking around the Capitol. Uh, it doesn't matter that they're committing a crime by actually being in the Capitol without authorization. No, uh, the PSYOP is that January 6th didn't actually happen. Come on, people. It was an attempted coup. This PSYOP that Speaker Johnson and all the network of lackeys below him who are spreading these lies are engaged in psychological operations against America. That's why it matters. Absolutely. The dude dude said that he was going to release it in order to get accountability from the government, right? The reason why, I mean, when he released it, he was he was releasing it as um, here. Look at this and and figure out why it was actually the government that did January sixth. That's literally how he presented it. Um, and and this is just forty four thousand hours of of information data that our adversaries can analyze and figure out. Right? When does uh, Congressperson X show up in the morning? Right. You, you the, there's video of people coming in and out of of uh, for, you know, days on end. It, it is a national security emergency. Yeah. And we fucking let those things right. out. Right. Much less something, you know, good. It's, it's, right. it's batshit. Well, creepy Mike Johnson Santos is an anti-democratic agent. uh working to weaken the U.S. and fealty to the uh, Christian nationalist Kremlin cadre. That's what he's doing. His his job is to weaken us. And uh, our job as members of the media is to ensure that he has the shortest, uh, you know, speakership, uh, you know, right right after Kevin McCarthy or before. This, when Jim says it's a national emergency, that is not an overstatement. He's an anti-democratic force working uh, deftly to weaken us. And a lot of what we're going to see is what Ruth ben refers to as garbage, trash, politics, all designed to weaken us. Also, they are engaged in a massive cover-up for the role, Mike Johnson's own role, uh, in trying to overthrow our country. And what better way to distract from that than to flood the zone with uh, more than, uh, you know, our 10,000 year old wet brain can handle, to quote Jackie Singh. I would just like to remind our audience that uh, Mike Johnson has gone on record for saying that basically America deserves God's wrath. Um, why would you put a person like that in a position of power and leadership? I don't understand it. The last thing I want to say to quote Ruth is Mike Johnson being House Speaker is an authoritarian shock event. That's what it is. And we cannot take our um, we cannot we cannot take the uh, our foot off the gas in trying to get get him out of there as quickly as possible. It's incredibly dangerous. Indeed. Final story this week, not just another pretty face. Heidi started our show today talking about Marjorie Taylor Greene, a woman uh, who uses Gamergate tactics in a position of power. I would argue that other women have been elevated to positions of power by those who would hide behind their womanhood and utilize them as shields. And specifically, what I'm referring to is uh, this story by Bloomberg, in which, uh, you know, new college in Austin, investors are coming. Oh, in the story, they mention it's Barry Weiss's uh, university that she set up in Austin. Well, I would argue that's a load of crap 
because if you pay attention to this network like I do and what activities they're engaged in, you would know that the Austin University is actually a front for Joseph Lonsdale and people associated with the Test Creole cult. Uh, accelerationists spreading dangerous ideas, uh, trying to recruit more fascist foot soldiers, basically. And she's not the only woman, Barry Weiss, who's doing this. Uh, I would argue that a story that also came out this week about Linda Yaccarino, uh, Elon Musk's uh, CEO of Twitter, um, they're fighting anti-Semitism. She is covering for Musk after he publicly endorsed anti-Semitic lies on the $44 billion PSYOP cannon that he owns. So that's why it matters. Uh, I was just going to say, um, you know, the explosion of anti-Semitism over the last week, and I wrote about this, um, uh, was all sort of simultaneously... It, like there was a memo that went out that it's okay now to not use euphemisms, right? You had Charlie Kirk and, you know, Flynn and all of these people just directly attacking Jewish people, right? They don't even hide it anymore. They weren't even pretending that it was anything other than Jewish people are conspiring against white people. That was, that was Musk's, uh, what Musk was backing up. That's what this what this is about is creating a another myth like the stab in the back myth from uh, Weimar Germany, which brought that country down. Yeah. Uh, the central myth that brought Weimar Germany down and brought Nazi Germany in is that Jews and communists were conspiring together to bring down uh, Germany. And it, we've got the same exact lie being spread by the richest man in the world and his fucking stenographer, uh, Linda Yaccarino, who gets $6 million to just pretend the world isn't the world. So thank you both for that. Um, Linda Yaccarino is an example of delivering soft fascism. You know, pretty woman, mother of two, Catholic, you know, credible uh, resume. And here she is offering, you know, shelter and normalizing a fascist troll. And the reason I call her Goebbels and Prada is because I'm fighting an information war. And so is she. And she's literally offering cover and safe harbor uh, as we lunge toward fascism. And we've seen what's happened to Twitter uh, since M Musk took over the Twitter operation. I wrote her an open letter to resign in protest to redeem herself because the longer she normalizes a fascist troll, the more likely she'll never recover. She has a small window to do the right thing. I'm appealing to her uh, as a mother, mother to mother, um, to do the right thing. And I hope she does, but there are absolutely no signs of that. She keeps on delivering us exactly what Ruth predicted from the strong woman, which is a softer form of fascism, which is still fascism nevertheless. Well, until these uh, enablers of fascism are held to account, we're stuck in their hellscape. Jim Stewartson's Hellscape. Oh, fuck. I can't believe I had to do this. Um, but this week, I'm going to talk about Pizzagate. Pizzagate, if you don't know, is a conspiracy theory slash psyop uh, that started just before the 2016 election. The PSYOP, or Psychological Operation, is designed to make people believe that Democrats, liberals, and especially elites like Hillary Clinton are actually satanic pedophiles who traffic children. I want to just briefly um, 
remind people or let them know if they haven't heard this before, that this entire conspiracy theory, this lie, is based on Russian propaganda. So, briefly, historically, Jews have been for a thousand years accused of something called blood libel, which uh, alleges that Jews do lots and lots of blood sacrifice against Christians and children. This was then um, sort of popularized at the turn of the 20th century in something called the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which alleges that a cabal of elites, Jewish elites, intend to um, enslave and consume all the goyim. So this has been around for a thousand years. But then it was revived just before the 2016 election. How? Well, Mike Flynn sat with Vladimir Putin in December 2015. A few months later, the GRU, who Mike Flynn is, is very familiar with, uh, hacked the DNC servers and fished John Podesta, Hillary Clinton's aide at the time. WikiLeaks and a number of other Kremlin cutouts on Twitter started to publish these emails, um, started to publish information that they hacked. And it had a very disruptive um, effect on the 2016 election. And it was especially um, rough because there was a, um, a, a lot of allegations, as pe if people recall, about her emails, right? So these all sort of molded together during, you know, the summer of 2016. Now, a very important date in U.S. history is October 7th, 2020. What happened on October 7th? Well, the Access Hollywood grab em tape came out. Um, at the same time that the DHS issued a warning that WikiLeaks, Guccifer, and other Kremlin cutouts were spreading Russian propaganda. At the same time, or rather 30 minutes after the Access Hollywood tape, came out, um, WikiLeaks started publishing John Podesta's emails. So John Podesta's emails basically became the protocols of the elders of Zion of the 21st century. Now, how did that happen? Well, a bunch of white nationalist trolls um, organized around Peter Thiel and Mike Flynn's um, political action committee, MAGA3X, were using John Podesta's emails to make up conspiracy theories about Hillary Clinton. Specifically, on November 3rd, 2016, five days before the election, a literal Nazi named Jared Wyand, who, you know, is one of the most notorious anti-Semites um, on the internet, posted a completely false set of code words that people were supposed to look for in John Podesta's emails. So they did. So they took words like... Um, you know, rainbow and handkerchief and whatnot, but also pizza, which was supposed to represent little girls. It did not. So they went through a whole bunch of, of these emails and substituted these code words that were made up 
by a Nazi who worked for Mike Flynn and Peter Thiel, they went through those emails and started to allege, look, you can tell because of the word pizza in a couple of emails that obviously John Podesta is a satanic pedophile and because he is, therefore so must Hillary Clinton. It's insane. During this entire period, uh, it was not only MAGA-3X, Mike Flynn and Peter Thiel's um, psychological operations group um, that was promoting Pizzagate. It was WikiLeaks itself and its anti-Semitic founder, Julian Assange, and it was the Internet Research Agency, which was run by Evgeny Prigozhin. The Internet Research Agency and Evgeny Prigozhin were allies of Eric Prince. Eric Prince worked with Wagner um, all over Africa and the Middle East. So, Pizzagate, again, let me review, and I'm so sorry I have to do this, because Elon Musk now is getting involved in Pizzagate propaganda because he's mad at Media Matters, which was wrapped falsely into the Pizzagate conspiracy theory seven years ago. So, to review, Pizzagate. Kremlin propaganda based on the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is based on blood libel that started a thousand years ago. So if you see anybody out there, if your friends, your loved ones, anyone you know starts to bring this stuff up, please be aware let them know the facts. Um, I've written about this on my substack, mind-war.com, uh, if you're interested. Um, thanks again, and arrest Mike Flynn. Give you an, an example of how I see Russia and their propaganda uh, way of thinking. Imagine you are in a bar. Yeah, and you have a nice uh, time with your friends and you just having fun. And there is always a guy in the bar who is just staring at you. And he already want to fight with you. And everybody know it, you know. And you can pretend he's not there. You can pretend like you are avoiding him. La, la, la. But there is only two ways to solve this question. Or you ending your beautiful evening with friends and just leaving, which will be smart if you are able to do that. Or you need to fight this bully. <laughs> there is only one uh, chance to do it. And with Russia propaganda channels, uh, you need to make them forbidden. It's lie. It's just lie. They're ruining the world. According to Aristotle, when you are saying lie, you are creating a world which doesn't exist. And you put people into a world which doesn't exist. So in one moment we realized uh, that it was not true. They need to build a, their world from a scratch. And this is why Dante put a traitors in the worst place of hell. Because they are creating a world which doesn't exist. And force people to live in a world which doesn't exist. That, of course, is Ukrainian soldier and filmmaker Volodymyr Demchenko on his previous visit to RadPod. I still think it's just one of the most brilliant clips that we have uh, acquired on this show. Um, we are going to be uh, showing you now our second interview with Vlad in a bathroom, which is one of the safer places to be when you're in war. And um, we're going to tell you why Russia needs to collapse as an empire state. Volodymyr Demchenko, we are so, so grateful that you are back with us today and that you are safe and well and you look good. I am guessing that you have been through nothing but hell since the last time we checked in. Um, but I'm very, very happy to see you, you know, healthy and well. And we're doing everything we can from here to try to 
support Ukraine, but please give us an update on how you're doing, how your family's doing, and anything you'd like us to know. <laughs> yeah, hello, guys. Uh, I know. That's, <sighs> I don't know even from where to start, you know, like sometimes you don't see people for years and years and years, and after that you're meeting them on the street and they're like, so, what's up? And you're like, <laughs> I don't know from where to start. I uh, know. Uh, I know. Anyway, uh, last three months I spent on uh, the Parisian region on the southern front of Ukraine. It's been a wild experience and um, I'm okay. Like, I'm one of those lucky people who managed to uh, stay alive and uh, with all my parts of my body uh, yeah. on the zero places. Uh, now I'm in Kyiv just for two days, uh, actually moving from the front to a training camp and my commander was kind enough to give me like two day off just spent in Kyiv before I would jump in back to army routine. So I'm waiting for my train, which will arrive in six hours. Uh, so now I will okay. spend one of these hours with you. Can you, I'm That's so grateful. Old. I'm so grateful. Can you please remind our viewers that this war started for you and really for your country uh, many years ago and that you were actually involved in that uh, beginning in nine, nine years ago, I think, when you were injured? Can you just sort of remind our viewers of that um, part of your story? Uh, basically, yeah, for... <laughs> If if we will be really like uh, deep into the history, this war didn't start even nine years ago. Ukraine is under Russian uh, a colo colonial politics for like 300, 400 years ago. We have like wars and wars. It's it's war that never stops. Maybe somebody thinks that USSR was a peaceful time, but uh, you, in this case, you can say that Congo was uh, peaceful while Belgium uh, owned it. You know, it's almost the same but uh those part of this war where i was uh, active member starts in 2013 actually it's 10 years ago like exactly this uh, uh november 21 when the ukrainian revolution started uh why i say it was war because it's clearly was war against uh, pro-russian uh politics who occupied ukraine like president yanukovych Let, let's remember how this start all country want to move uh, in the direction of Europe, try to be a part of modern and uh, democratic world. And Yanukovych promised that as a political course. And one day before the summit in uh, Estonia, in Tallinn, I believe, uh, he just canceled it and said we'll move towards Russia. And those evening, uh, a lot of students came out on the street of uh, Kyiv just to make a peaceful protest. And those protests was end up by cruel uh, being. Uh, it was like like really big violence those night when police came uh, out and just beat the shit out of those people, mostly kids like who was on the street. And uh, we know history of Russia. We saw history of Belarus, which is now you can say Belarus as well. Nobody cares. And we understood that if they did it once, they will do it second time, like, I mean, police. And that was a big try to put Ukraine into autocratic uh, government. Uh, and this is, for me, where war starts, for real. And I was an uh, active participant of those revolution. And after the revolution uh, was finished with Yanukovych left the country, uh, Russia occupied the part of Ukraine and make a whole this provocation with Donbass just captured to another region. And I joined a uh, Ukrainian volunteer corps just like as a civil person. I never have like a military experience. And I joined unofficial because uh, the Ukrainian army was in really bad condition in 2014. And uh, they can't afford like everybody uh, in uh, in army. So I joined it voluntarily with no payment and spent there almost two years with little breaks because I was forced to come back to my civil life to make more money and come back like to a front line. And now it's my second campaign, uh, which start 24 of February 2022. And uh, it's happening till now, unfortunately. And I think it will happen long time in the future oh my gosh how are people feeling how are soldiers feeling right now we had so hoped that we wouldn't be 
talking to you at this time with the war still going on and yet here we are um depends of uh about what they're thinking because they're thinking about different things differently so if you will specify your question i will answer you better. how's the morale again depends on which you are, are <laughs> like if we're talking about like uh keep fighting like you know, I want to say, like, with all these uh, things that happening now with uh, Ukraine losing, like, uh, interest around the world, um, I don't think it will stop Ukrainians from fighting, like, mm-hmm. for real. It can make change the quality of fighting. More people will die, but I'm pretty sure that, like, now this uh, war will turn into the real uh, war, World War I, uh, like, uh, kind of war with trenches and just like people sitting there in trenches for years and killing each other. We have a lot of Kalashnikovs, even like if the Western supply will cut off, like we have millions of Kalashnikovs and billions of rounds for them. It's enough to war continues for years, years and years and years. And I don't see any, any, any signs that Ukrainian army uh, want to stop fighting. Zero chances. Of course, I don't believe Jim. That. Yeah, uh, obviously here we've got, um, you know, there's a now a conflict in the Middle East um, to distract um, everybody from from Ukraine. I was wondering, you know, how 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 are people feeling about um, how are you feeling about that um, potentially impacting, you know, global support for for Ukraine. I'll just say, in my opinion, I think what's going on in the Middle East is being encouraged, let's say, uh, by Putin um, because he wants to distract from from Ukraine. I was wondering what your thoughts were. Uh, You know, I didn't. uh, I think I abandoned Twitter for a month now for a moment when this war starts. Because uh, I don't want to be a participant of this like uh, show yeah. that calls like give us attention, we suffer more. That's yep. that's ugly. That's just ugly. I don't play this game like and you know when I saw this uh, memes about like oh Western world just turn away from Palestinian like I see who 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 doing that. Like that's clearly understandable, yes. and I don't want to be a part of this game where I try to prove somebody in the world that I suffer more than somebody else. Like it's not my part of the game. Like I have my work, and I feel it's ugly. It's just ugly to make this competition. You know, like uh, which side uh, suffer more. Just ugly, and I don't want to be a part of it in any kind. Like so. I have war in my country. I have a lot of things happening here. And I don't want to say that, like, uh, I don't care about those people in uh, Gaza or Israel who are dying. They are still people. But look, let's be honest. Like, let's really be honest. Uh, you look at your uh, suffering uh, as a much more important. Like, r- war is right in front of me. I didn't watch. Yeah. I don't need to watch news. So... And again, yeah. this story is so complicated. I hate to see people in Twitter who have like two like brain cells who don't even read the history of those regions, don't know what's going on, and they have a position that they really want to show everybody yes. in the world. And they can't last even two minutes on conversation without going in like very big emotions. So right. like if person can give me a text, like I mean just meaningful text about what's going on i don't see any reason to talk about it and spend my time on it just don't see any reason and -hmm. unfortunately 98 percent of what's going on now in uh, uh, social media is just trash people don't know what they're talking about about who they talking like no education about uh, it's just emotions zero meaning emotions your emotions. I am always blown away at how knowledgeable you are because you understand the hot psychological war that we are in. And you understand that when someone shows a horrific image on social media, that there are many, many, many accounts where their job is just to divide people up 
look how terrible this picture is. Pick a side. That is social media. And I learned that from Paul Conroy, who I'm sure you probably have met along the way, the photojournalist uh, that John Sweeney and Zarina Zabriskie are currently working with. And Paul. Yeah, Paul Conway is a friend of my girlfriend. She knows him very well. She oh, they work together. Yeah. Amazing. Well, that's that brings us to the well, there's a number of things that I'd like to discuss with you, but one of them is you come into this uh war as a filmmaker. That's that's your background. You're a filmmaker and now, of course, a soldier, but how does that um are you able to uh, use that those skills and document what you see. Is that part of your service in this war? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing this from time to time because, you know, like after two years, uh, um, I manage how it works and I'm like, I know between all my colleagues and they know that hey, this guy is good at that. So sometimes I can go with other groups, like they're doing their job and I can afford just to take camera and go with them. Of right. course, if like we have work, like uh, it's no place for filming, but still I'm collecting some materials, but just collecting doesn't like, don't editing nothing, uh, just collecting videos and filming, filming and putting right. it on the side. Oh, I'm glad that you're doing that. We we had a good talk about the difference between photojournalism and those who use shock images just to divide people. And again, one of the things that's so remarkable about our previous interview with you is that you are not fooled by the information war because you grew up inoculating yourself by reading books, reading history books, understanding what's reality and what's not. And we in America have literally no inoculation against information war. It's still invisible to most people. They don't see it. And I very much appreciate that you were able to use, you know, Dante and Aristotle in the same sentence when you talked about how <laughs> Russia's lies are ruining the world. And, you know, do you have anything that you can contribute there on how people can better inoculate themselves against the lies that are ruining the world? Um, this is the danger of the lie. You don't know it's lie until like it's actually became a reality in front of you. And after that, you're sitting, your world is ruined and there is nothing you can do. Uh, there is no way back. So, and you know, watch what even worse, uh, people want to believe in lie. It's more so much simplified life. You know, like it's very complicated. Life is a very complicated thing. You need to understand so many things on so many levels. Like uh, this story with Israel and Palestine. It is complicated. There is no way to say Israel is right or Palestinian is right. It's just like 100% clear. No, no, it's complicated. Each step of this story is complicated. This is how it happens, but... This is how like world like uh, world history usually uh, works, but people don't want to see that. They don't want to see it. They don't. People so uh, want so want to believe in lies. So they uh, really want to believe that flat is uh, Earth is flat, because it's like for example they believe in a theory that like for example secret Jewish government rules the world. So they lying to us that the uh, Earth is uh, is a ball. Why? They don't have any critical uh, obligation, like explanation to that cause. Just because it's explaining their uh, views. It don't explain the world. It's explain their views. It's comfortable for them to explain the world where they exist. And you know what's happening when they see the truth? They most of the people. Even they see it, witness it with their eyes, later they will like find any other explanation but accept the truth. Like to be uh, a person who appreciates the truth, you need to be a very strong person and a very smart person because truth is not pleasant at all. It's very complicated. And you know, like let's uh, talk about, for example, therapy. When you have a, like, a mental uh, problem, for example, you have a depression, or you break up with uh, somebody who you've been close to, there is no way that you can fix this situation by saying lie to yourself, like, mm -hmm. no, I'm good one, you know, it's she who are bad one, or like he who are bad. No, you need to look at yourself and say, like, man, 
that was shitty situation, <laughs> painful, very bad. And you need to go to deepest pain and deep, most painful feelings to solve it. But this is not how world working now. Like world preferred to turn away from painful truths and look at a simplified explanation of how it thinks works because it's fit to them. They see themselves smarter, more powerful, you know. And that's why I didn't see any any um, way to break the lie except your own will. And this is not something that like you watch a guy in Twitter or YouTube and like. I will do that. No, it's 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 complicated thing. You you just, it's a long way to do. Like it's it's complicated. Oh my god, I oh, love yeah. that <laughs> high five. Pa- pa- yeah. Painful truth. It, it's painful truth and yeah. comfortable lies that are going yeah. to kill us. Right? Yeah. Um, right. So I have I have something to say to you, Volodymyr, uh, because I do follow you on social media. Um, you know, I'm putting together my own little. Uh, when the war ends, Volodymyr gets a new bed fund. So we're going to make sure <laughs> yes. no more sleeping in mud and trenches for you, my man. We're going to find you something okay. dreamy. All okay. right. That's, yeah, that's going to be thing. cool because actually one, one of my dreams to like now I realized that I'm old enough to just find a place where to live. Like, because I was a uh, like nomad person just traveling around the world. Now I think like, yeah, it's actually. It can be nice to have a house, like my own house and the place where to come back. So is this kind of dreams that keep you like yes. uh, safe, you know, like it's something in the future uh, towards where you can move. Because yes. like, to have such an idea is very important. So That's okay, beautiful. I, I That's beautiful. That. <laughs> uh, high five is you, his word. When he says he's okay. going to get you a bed, he's going to get you a bed. I, I already got stuff okay. picked out for you, man. I already know what I'm getting you. <laughs> okay. Anyway, and, so, and he's and he's fancy too. He's fancy. Oh, I am. I am. I'm yeah. a fancy <laughs> son of a bitch. Um, <laughs> here's my question for you. Um, we have been exposed to a painful truth, at least here in the United States, and I think in Ukraine as well, that. Uh, Elon Musk is no genius. As a matter of fact, I've been saying for a few years, Elon Musk is a fucking problem. And Elon Musk seems to have hamstrung Ukraine uh, in the Black Sea. What do you think the reaction of the average Ukrainian soldier would be if they saw Elon Musk on the street in Kiev today? I don't think something violent will happen, to be honest. People don't like him here anymore, like, but Ukrainians are not a wild mob that will just, like, beat the shit out. I think he will be forced to uh, talk to angry people. Yeah, that mm. will possibly will happen. But I also think that he will... What will happen? He will escape, like, he escaped from those journalists where he, like, you know, this famous video where uh, some journalists chase him and, like, hey, what you can say about Ukraine? He's just like, this is what will happen. Nobody will touch him, of course. Uh, nothing wild will happen. But, you know, mask, it's more your problems, guys. And now, <laughs> like, I understand. Uh, you know, he he's playing this election game because... What what he's doing? He just put all his uh, coins on Trump because he knows that Trump can make his life easier. He can open doors with his leg and say like, "Hey, I need this contract for my company." And he knows that like Biden and uh, most of people wouldn't let him do it so easily, but Trump will. So like Trump, Tucker Carlson, like and Elon Musk is just uh, guys who are working for Elon Musk and the Republicans who win the election. So it, I believe he's just a political guy. Like he, he don't really believe in what he's talking. He play a political game. He buy a Twitter. Like he, he is not stupid. Like let's say, it. let's make it clear. He's not stupid at all. Uh, he plays this long game and he helping Trump to win election because he believe Trump will help him to create and new markets in the United States and around the world, and especially in Russia, maybe. Maybe he think about uh, his future business in Russia, because Russia, he is very um, depend on the resources, like like aluminum. Resources. So maybe, yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe he will can. I can say like I understand like what he's doing, but 
is definitely definitely playing this political game like uh, and try and everything he's writing he just tried to help uh, Trump win election about this border control of United States about Ukraine he's playing this game just in very clear sight but in Ukraine I don't see I don't see that somebody will do something violent it's just like it wouldn't be a pleasant to walk for him nobody likes him <laughs> here anymore I, I love but how so. you say he's our problem I, I really I no but it's clear, I, I, guys, I, I you... agree I agree he's He's uh, he's our problem. We got to deal with but some look, of these problems. But look, again, let's think about that. Like we was talking about it with guys and I said like, look, I read so many books like fantastic book where you have this like genius. It's clearly this like uh, type of the genius from a book of Philip Dick and other guys who is like a genius, but like crazy. They're not, uh, they're not good for humanity. They think about their own interest. He don't yes. think about humanity at all. He think about like, he believes he's better than us. Yeah. And it's what's make him like really dangerous. Yeah. As soon as person believe he's better than everybody else, this is where you're having a problem. Hitler, like I don't want to compare Hitler and Elon Musk, but it's obvious, you know, Hitler was think he's better than everybody else and make everybody in Germany believe they are better than everybody else. And yeah. this is uh, that's why they have a right to decide everybody other destinies. This is what uh, Elon Musk is doing with Twitter and clearly. He 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 not stupid. He understands that when he makes a memes about Ukraine, that he's playing with millions of people destinies. Yeah. He's doing it not like because he's stupid. He's doing it because it's his decision to play with his destinies. And it's what makes him like even more dangerous and um dangerous just dangerous yeah He's dangerous clearly. person Jim. yeah it's it's uh um i think there's a common theme here between you know some of these people which is psychopathy right um i think i think you know you put your finger on it they think they're better than everyone else and so they believe that their the their collection of power is is justified and I think, uh, you know, uh, our mutual enemy, Vladimir Putin <laughs> over there, uh, is the one behind it. Um, I mean, it is a fact that Elon Musk left Starlink Dark over the Black Sea, right? Um, how did that how how did that actually affect um i mean to the extent you can tell me and i know that's sensitive but uh, you know how how did it actually affect people on the ground and and could it if you had that coverage could you have you know done something about the fleet that was just sitting in the sea you know bombing the shit out of civilians Look, I'm not the right person to ask these questions. It's like not on my level of of work. Like I'm just a regular surgeon. Oh, uh, uh, you're in, not. In, you're in, not a regular soldier, man. <laughs> no, but no. even even but in I, different I know what you type mean. of, of uh, we know what you mean. position, we know what you mean. Look, the things that like, uh, and it's clear. You know, soldier on the ground, see a couple of kilometers in front of yeah. him, and that's all. Yeah. And that's all. And but you know what I can tell you. Uh, for last three months, we don't use Starlink on the, on the ground. Like, personally, we, are, we don't use it. Like, I don't use it. So, for me and for my team, it wouldn't, like, hurt me, whatever. Like, don't care. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, maybe on a bigger scale, it will uh, hurt Ukraine. But again, it's not Musk who provides this service to us. Yes. It's United States government yes, right. who pay Musk who yes. have contracts with United States government. Yeah. And when people turn the table like, oh, Elon Musk gives this to Ukraine. <laughs> like, guys, he received like billions of dollars from United States government and he's just doing his contract. He don't have just... a choice. It's you. He don't I... have a choice. So actually it was maybe even violation of the contract. I don't know. Yeah. Like, let's say, look at the other side. Uh, maybe it's a problem again, not of Ukraine, but uh, United States government who signed up a contract with a person who violated the contract. And you know, 
Maybe he will turn off uh, internet next time in Israel, Iraq, Afghanistan for your troops. Maybe it's time to think about that. It's (laughs) like you depend on one person, like on such a level. Maybe we will ask it. Let's stop the war wherever we are. Like where? Uh huh. This country. We need, we need peace. Just give them. Yeah, give them peace. Crimea. Yeah, give them Crimea. Whatever. Stop and being you so know picky. what? And imagine, like, if like it will happen, if he will want to play an uh, election game with any of presidents who are like doing any kind of uh, uh, foreign operation. In Syria, for example, he turned off internet in Syria. A U.S. army fail, no, bam! Everybody is unhappy about the modern government, and you have a clashes. You have a political problem only because one guy decide like that. His technology is not for war. You sign up it's, contracts. You sell it. It's you sell unbelievable it, man. how much this lands back squarely in the U.S. government's lap. You are so 100% correct. Thank you for pointing that out. I want to know, Jim touched on one of the lines. Oh, we want peace. We want negotiations. Jim touched on that. How do we... Do you have any propaganda we can fight back with on that? Because... That's absurd. You don't, as Paul Conroy said, this is a good old fashioned land grab and an attempted extermination of people. You don't just say, okay, we'll just give this to you as you try to steal everything. What is like a, uh, how do we fight kind of fire with fire back on that? Just have peace yeah. negotiations, which. There will be, you know, even there will be, if there will be a negotiation, because, you know, in the beginning of the war, there will was some kind of negotiation in Istanbul, you know, where they were speaking, where is the result of this negotiation? If somebody wants negotiations, they can sit and talk. What will be the result of it? We have Minsk agreement. First, second, third. Where is the result? Ukraine lose more territory. Who believe in the negotiation? From Ukrainian side, there will be no... Uh, Ukraine would... Look, there is a very situation now. It's so complicated that most of the people don't even think about that uh, in reality. Because look, let's see uh, that Ukraine, Ukraine, uh, somehow will uh, take back the territory with Crimea. And now we are on the border of 1991, legal Ukrainian border. Russia already includes the territory in their constitution. So now, officially, according to Russian constitution, Ukrainians are invaders who occupy the territory of Russia. So there is no way for this war to stop with any kind of negotiation. There is only one way for this war to be over forever. Russia needs to collapse as a state. As it did uh, to uh, austro hungarian as it happened to like any kind of Os- Ottoman empires, that's only one to uh, one to way to happen. Russia is modern empire that consists from one hundred fifty eight nationalities. Look at that. Look when you see a Russian troops image, you don't see Russian as you are imagining them. There is a lot of Asian people there. Actually, more than a half. It's all nations who are enslaved and sent to a war by Russians. Nation which only 20 million people, other 130 is other people. They need to collapse as an empire state. Because it's only one way to survive for Russia, it's to expand. Yeah. And this is what they're doing. And what's happening now? A negotiation. You want to give this land to uh, Russia? You will prolong their existence and their like war. Like, look at that. It's a way how they survive. They need to show their people one in 10 years that we are expanding. We are great. We are powerful. We are big. They wouldn't stop in like next turn or death. Yeah. Right. After that, Baltic states. Uh, so people who want a negotiation need to show me one negotiation with Russia that works. Yeah. One. Exactly. Yes, exactly. One. Yeah, One. exactly. Give there me reason. To, give me None. reason to talk to them. Zero. Give me reason. Zero. We have. We yeah. tried. Yeah. It doesn't work. Yeah. But I want to show you a negotiation with Great Britain, United States, and Russia, where the, when uh, these three countries say, "Guys, 
uh, we don't think you can handle a nuclear weapon. Please give it to Russia. We give our yeah. nuclear weapon to Russia. And we signed up a paper. We promise you that you will be safe. So what's happening now? If you want to take a part of our territory and give it to Russia, this means your words mean nothing. This means a United States and a policeman of the world and the provide uh, most um, uh, grateful, uh, greatest democracy in the world doesn't exist anymore. Nobody believes in that. And you know what's worse? When Ukraine, who was uh, abandoned, yeah? Like, if we will give Ukraine to Russia, this means, like, done. You abandoned Ukraine. So if it happens, and in one moment, Ukraine want to restore our nuclear weapon, because this agreement was violated by all pa- participants who give us a uh, promise to protect us. You know what will happen? The sanction against Ukraine will be much more worse and powerful than the sanction against Russia. All these countries will cut us out from the world because we, one side we have border with Russia and Belarus, other is the European Union. We don't have any land borders through where we can bring food, stuff. Sanction from Russia doesn't work. Two years, nothing happens. If Ukraine, which have a right to restore nuclear weapon because this contract doesn't work, and we have all nuclear plant, we have uranium, we have everything, we will have problem in Ukraine. So any kind of agreement in Ukraine, not believable anymore yeah. with no one. Still, until we're right. getting some kind of supply from US and Great Britain, we still believe that maybe, maybe we wouldn't be abandoned by a free world. As soon as it will stop, done. Like democratic world, yeah. what you call democratic world, done forever. Yeah, right. China, all these countries yeah. win. For a fact, you, you can see a result the next day, but it's a fact. Everybody will look and, ah, and next series with Ukraine will happen in parallel with Taiwan. That's all. Taiwan is done as well. I, I have friends from Taiwan, uh, Taiwanese friends. I meet them when I was traveling in Africa. I'm chatting with them and they ask me, like, what do you think will happen? I said, war. Guys, war will happen in your country for sure. And they're preparing. They're preparing, like, and they're telling, like, my brother is in army. I'm afraid about him. It's a good time to be afraid because China will invade Taiwan, Taiwan for sure. Because they see nothing. What possibly could happen to China? Like, what you can do? Nothing. Yeah. You can do it to Russia, who is much, 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 much more weak than uh, China. China. You, yeah. You're not able to, uh, I mean, like to Russia. You're not, you're not able to do something to Russia. What you will do to China? Um, this is uh, how people think yeah. around the world. Yeah. Um, speaking of invasions, uh, I wanted to ask you, since you were on the ground, obviously, during Maidan, um, uh, what was the, uh, when when Putin was uh, building up forces uh, outside Crimea, um, you were, you were fighting Maidan, um, was there a, was there an understanding in Ukraine that there was a, a invasion about to happen in Crimea or no. I, how, how, how was it? I'm just curious. Cause I, I know it was kind of a surprise. It was a surprise to some people, right. That the, the little green men just started showing up in, in the town halls and stuff. Right. And literally just taking over cities. Um, but I was just, was there any warning or anticipation of that in, in Ukraine? Look, for everyone, it was clear that Russia is not our friend at all. Like, of uh, course, for yeah. sure. Because, like, from regular Russians to, like, present, we see a violation. And it's just, like, how they, like, they see Ukrainians, like, as a net. You know, something, like, not very serious. They make jokes about that all the time, about our country, about, like, it's, it was obvious. It's, like, nothing. Uh, and somehow... We realized that it's uh, Maidan a revolution. It's only the first uh, chapter. It was clear that it will somehow we will clash. We will have clashes with uh, Russia, but they did it on a, such a moment when just uh, this bloody nightmare on Kiev uh, happens. When like 100 people was just uh, murdered by police, like 
just shot on the street in front of yeah. everybody else. And the government fall, like president escaped, and they did it exactly in this moment. Yeah. So our focus was out of this uh, problem. Imagine today you have this like Congress of people dying on the street, your president escaping, next day news like boom, uh, Russian helicopters over Crimea. It's like violation wow. grows every day. Not, not uh, so, a coincidence. Right. right? No. Not Look, <laughs> like uh, coincidence, it's only for people on the West who are not Russian speakers, like and exactly. who is not interested. <laughs> Russians make a medals for taking Crimea two weeks before invasion. Right. Can, can I just point out? Can I just point out that Donald Trump, in his planning and plotting for when he gets elected for president again, he has already said that he will deploy the military on American soil to stop any sort of Maidan protest that may occur here if he steals the election in the United States. They're already planning for it here. And may we remind everybody who his campaign manager is the same handler that, uh, you know, Yanukovych had, Yanukovych had in Ukraine. Same, oh, same, same guy. Yeah. Um, Manafort, yeah, yeah, Manafort. very famous guy. Yes. So one thing, because um, we only have a couple minutes left with you, I just wanted to say you brought up such an important point, the Ruth ben Giot, who's a scholar of Italian fascism, and she wrote a book called Strongman about 100 years of fascism, and she really maps out the playbook. She says that the reason you have to shut these guys down is because other world leaders are watching to see what they can get away with. And so what you said was so incredibly yes. important. Yes. It's like, yes. it's like, what, how far can they push it? What can they get away with? And right now, we've been saying this for a couple of years on this show, Ukraine is all that stands between whether or not this world continues with democratic nations or not. And, and yeah, uh, definitely, and, and definitely. In just, in just a kind of a final words, what can you say to our viewers who are global really about that and how we can help? What is the best way we can be most effective? Uh, you know, I believe that if you are uh, on the street and you see some violence happen, for example, like some huge man attacking women on the street and she's begging for help and you're just passing by, you are kind of this guy as well. Like you are a part of this violence. If you just let it happen without trying to help, and if you are calling your country democratic country, and you see young uh, countries that exist thirty years and was under empire rules for three hundred years, trying to be a part of modern world, yeah, maybe they are not successful in something, but it's clearly a message is that like, hey guys, we want to be with you. Like, help us to figure it out. And even after war starts, they don't give up and try to fight for what you call a democratic uh, choice. And you just abandon them. So it means you are not uh, what you think about yourself. And that's all. It's just two ways. First, fight. Second, say, like, nah, it's not our game. Goodbye. Like, we are done with that. And be wow. honest. And don't play this game. So please, if you see some violence and you don't prevent it, don't be involved, don't try to help. Maybe it's just time to say you are afraid to do so and you just want to go home and sleep on your car, couch and don't think about what happens without you seeing that and pretend it's nothing happens. But after that, think about who you are. What kind of person are you if you let it happen? And now make it look at the scale of the country. If your country is big, powerful, you grow it like uh, on the freedom of person and you see on the other side of the world and you growing actually this part of the world, you call it Western civilization, democratic world. And there is a pa huge part, 50 million people who try to be a part of this world, not because you are rich and give us money. No, they do, we don't ask your soldiers. We don't, we are actually... Why are we asking weapon? It's a very logical uh, thing. Because we didn't prepare for war. We was a peaceful country. That's why we need weapon. We was a relaxed, peaceful country, try to build our institution. Uh, each election, we select other president. Yeah, it's like we try to figure it out. 
look around on other uh, USSR countries. Guys in rule for 30, 35 years, it's, it's not democratic countries. We're only one who tried to be a part of this world. And you will, if you will le left us here, Ukraine again will be a part of this empire. And all these millions of innocent Ukraine, Ukrainians will be part of this uh, army of murderers who is sent just as a mid green, green to next country. And it will happen. It happens in the world history again and again. All those countries who lose their fight was sent on the next war to fight <laughs> their, uh, their friends just without any question. And what's happening now on Ukraine occupied territories? People who didn't left now, Russian mobilize them by force. So just be fair with you. You want to call yourself a democratic and like brave or like just don't pretend and say like, no, I'm afraid of that and it's not my business and we are done with that. Just be honest and say like clearly what you think about that. But don't play this game like that. Yeah, I'm too smart for this. Nah, nobody believes you. Sorry, my English is so bad. Your English is so great. You just brought it on home. We couldn't have asked for more than that. Thank you so very much for this incredible interview Thank you guys. and for taking the time to be with us today. We are just um, honored to have you.